So I think I was checking the uh, mic. It functions admirably well, uh, apparently. So uh, we will start our panel. We are uh, privileged uh, with, uh, I have to say, a very, very impressive panel on this issue of the major mid-term, long-term issues for the global economy. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the members of this panel. The, the first on my left would be Gabriel Felbenmayer, uh, director of the Austrian Institute of Economic Research, the WIFO, and professor at Vienna University. He is also, he was also the head of the IFO Center for International Economics in München, the very famous IFO Institute. And he was also president of the Kiel Institute of the World Economy. So an extraordinary career, if I may, in chairing a very, very important institution. We will then hear what uh, Sébastien Jean has to say. He's a senior associate of the IFRI and a professor of economics in Paris at the Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers. And he holds the chair Jean-Baptiste Say, which is a very, very good mentor, if I may, <laughs> on uh, industrial economy. He's also a member of many, many council and he has previously been director of the CP in Paris. So thank you, Sébastien, thank to you. come. We are very honored. John is a, an old friend, I have to say. I have to declare. <laughs> John is a friend. <laughs> Senior fellow of the Foreign Policy Institute at John Hopkins. Uh, he, is, uh, he was first deputy managing director in the IMF, was also acting managing director of the IMF, and uh, he, was, uh, uh, he had very important uh, uh, position in the private sector. So again, John, you're a globetrotter. We see you in Shanghai, in Seoul, in uh, everywhere in the world, in Delhi, and uh, you were kind enough to come. Thank you very, very much indeed. And uh, we have Marcus Nolan with us, so thank you, Marcus, very much. Executive Vice President and Director of Studies at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. <coughs> and uh, you have been Senior Economist at the Council of Economic Advisors in the Executive Office of the President of the United States. And uh, you, held, you hold research or held research and teaching position in ma many universities, top not universities, including Yale and John Hopkins. So here we are, blessed uh, with uh, your presence. And uh, I think uh, we could say that we are prolonging in the economic sphere what uh, uh, Thierry de Montbrial said a moment ago at the level of the globe and uh, uh, on, <coughs> on all dimension, if I may, including technological dimension political dimension, social dimension. We will be more modest. Uh, we will perhaps try to elucidate what are your main messages as regards precisely the main issues for the global economy in the present time. I would certainly say that there are many, many numerous uh, dimension uh, to the uh, questions which he asked uh, explicitly in our panel. I will only list those questions, but as I said, each of us has messages. We'll concentrate on some message, and it is what is important, taking into account their experience and um, what they have done in the world until now. So I would only mention technology, as said uh, Thierry, is a major, major driving force, and uh, we are experiencing with artificial intelligence something which uh, is particularly striking, but it's not near a start. It's only a start. Science and technology are progressing on a very large front. I will note climate change, don't insist, green transition. We are in, on a single spaceship, which is planet Earth, and we recognize that we had to take care, all of us, 
without any exception. And if there is a domain where it is absolutely clear that uh, all countries concerned have to take care, it is certainly taking care of the single spaceship in which we are. As another point would be, of course, uh, reflecting on global trade, what happens in global trade, what happens in the hedging of the global, long global value chain, the change of attitude with the global change is very striking, has a lot of, uh, I would say, counterproductive consequences, both as regards the growth on the planet and as regards also the push for inflation of the planet if we are not optimizing <coughs> the global value chain as we did before, but clearly this is a very important trend. We have, of course, the fight against inequalities, which was also mentioned by Thierry, I think is a, it is something which is generalized the world over. Advanced economy, emerging economies, all uh, countries and economies on the planet have this threat, uh, which is the looming inequalities. And of course, I will uh, uh, say a word on inflation, which is uh, one of the big, big challenges that we have today. On that, I would only say that I am reasonably confident that the central banks will regain control when time comes. I take it that uh, in the year 25, we will probably have inflation, core inflation, say, in order not to be too depending on the volatility of uh, some prices, but core inflation around 2% in the medium term, which is the single goal, the single definition of price stability that we presently have the world over. It came out of the crisis of Lehman that, uh, again, uh, Thierry mentioned. And I have to say, one of the major <coughs> consequences of the Lehman crisis is that all major central banks that are uh, members of the basket of the SDR, whose the currencies are uh, part of the basket of the SDR, so namely the US, Europe, Japan, and the UK have the same definition of price stability. I consider that this is something which is extremely important, underassessed, underestimated by, I would say, academia in general, uh, unfortunately, because again, it's one of the de facto uh, transformation of uh, the international monetary system that should be uh, analyzed and, uh, and uh, studied much more. That being said, I don't want to take much of, of the time, and I turn to my neighbor. What would, you, what would you say? How would you send your messages? I know that you have slides, yes. and I thank you for that. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Jean-Claude, thanks for the introduction. Uh, Thierry de Montréal for setting this up. It's always a pleasure to be here an event that I'm looking forward to the whole year. My privilege and uh, honor this morning is to start the session off, uh, and I'll do so with a number of slides. Uh, first of all, the state of the world economy, summarized uh, with a very Eurocentric view here, uh, four economies, uh, the Eurozone, the United States, the UK, and China. And what we see here is a state of fragility. No, we see that those bars uh, go up and go down. Um, the eurozone's not growing. Uh, these are quarter on quarter growth rates. The third quarter is just in flash estimates, so quite fresh. The eurozone is at the brink of a recession. The United States are surprising us with relatively high growth rates, quarter on quarter in the third quarter 2023. The annualized growth rate would be almost 5%. Uh, this is a lot. Huh? I'm not sure what uh, you say, uh, Jean-Claude, but uh, uh, in, those, in those times where we need to cool down our economies to get rid of inflation, this looks uh, red hot, uh, too much, and unsustainable. And China, the engine of growth for so many years, is uh, not growing steadily. It's up and down, and uh, one of the, the major impressions that this slide gives to me is how similar the Chinese and the American experience look like if you look at those, at those bars. And the United Kingdom here, uh, looking very much like uh, the Eurozone. The world is such growing with a rate at, of about 3% uh, in this year, next year, a little bit more, but certainly below the 
uh, levels that uh, we have seen over the last years. Now, that is not surprising given the shocks that we have been under. Uh, and I would say what we should take away from that is not only divergences across uh, the Atlantic and across China and, uh, and Europe, but a relative uh, lack of uh, collapse, no? because resilience is uh, what we should see here. Even for the Eurozone, uh, the feared recession, if it comes, will be a mild one, and uh, uh, we're not uh, facing big, big disaster here. The next year, some improvement in the Eurozone in our estimates, some improvement in the United Kingdom, uh, decline in the United States uh, and the shift sideways in China. The big issue for us economists over the last uh, two years or so, of course, has been inflation. The good news is that uh, headline inflation is coming down. Uh, on, the, uh, on the right hand side, you see the, the United States, on the left hand side, the Eurozone. In both, it's coming down. Core inflation is very much the same now in those two areas, um, surprisingly, something like 4.2, 4.1%. But what you also see is that um, uh, the Eurozone has uh, a larger uh, trajectory to run through. We have been at higher rates than the, than the Eurozone. And what uh, worries me, me here is uh, that um, the 2% target is still quite uh, uh, far away from us. Uh, if you look at the green, the green bars in this, uh, in this picture, this is services inflation, uh, and you see it's very high, both still in uh, the United States and also in the Eurozone. And the services inflation, of course, reflects wage growth most uh, or more than all, all the other categories. And so I think we, we must say the job's not yet done. Uh, the central bankers are gaining back control. That is true. But um, uh, I fear that uh, uh, we're really in a situation uh, higher for longer. Uh, as, the, as the professionals say, and uh, the fight against inflation will define the world economy for more than the next one or two years. My fear is that um, uh, the strong increase in interest rates uh, uh, will feed into financial risks, and we have not seen everything yet. So on top of all the geoeconomic uh, struggles that we're facing, the climate disaster, Financial risks, I think, are high. Uh, the rates will be longer for, higher for long, I've said so. But we know that monetary policy comes with a lag, and uh, that lag can be substantial. Um, and uh, my view is that uh, a, a large share of what monetary policy will achieve has not yet, is not yet visible in the data. Uh, we see that fiscal policy needs to be, needs to become sustainable again. That's true in the Eurozone, but it's very much true in the United States. Um, uh, and that too will put pressure on, uh, on growth and on, uh, on uh, the financial markets. Quantitative tightening has not really fully started. Uh, and that uh, uh, will also uh, uh, affect uh, interest rates, the long run interest rates and the growth perspectives. Only 20%, according to some uh, um, estimates, of the total impact of monetary policy tightening is yet in the data, so more to come. Uh, and um, uh, what I fear is that um, the financial crisis that we have seen you know, uh, showing its face um, uh, earlier this year is not yet over. Somewhere all those fixed income uh, assets must be that have uh, come under pressure over the, over the last uh, years with the higher interest rates. And we, we only need a big shock, you know, that forces uh, insurances, for example, to liquidate their holdings uh, to see more financial stress in the system. Uh, so I'm a bit fearful on this side, and I'm also a little bit fearful about the Eurozone. Inflation differential, differentials across the zone are huge. Uh, uh, in the October uh, inflation rates, the difference between Slovakia and Belgium is something like 950 basis points. That's enormous. Uh, and uh, something that worries me quite a bit, uh, we are far away from, a, from a, an optimal monetary area in Europe. This should not be possible uh, if we were really having an integrated single market. And the interest rate spread uh, across the Eurozone is up. Um, uh, look at Italy with almost 150% of debt over GDP and the, and the interest payments more than <laughs> doubling. Uh, that puts stress on the system. Now, if I, if I may look at the international arena, what we see is that uh, the boom uh, in use of economic sanctions is going on. This is the, the translation, if you like, in, in economics, what we see in the political world. Um, 
war by other means, as the political science colleagues say, political conflict that's fought out with economic means. The trend's not good, so this is data from the Global Sanction Database that I'm putting together with U.S. colleagues, that uh, exponential growth. Um, that is certainly something that's weighing on, uh, on the growth perspectives of the world economy and shows that the political risks are, of course, translating into economic risks because sanctions mean uh, disruption of global value chains mean uh, decoupling, at least at the bilateral level. And so that's what we see here in terms of globalization. That's my preferred measure of globalization is just taking a quantity index of international goods traded divided by quantity <laughs> index of industrial production. So we're hopefully comparing here apples with apples and uh, not bananas. Uh, and what we see here is Resilience on the one hand, no? so the world has not deglobalized, but, it, but the hyperglobalization here in blue has stopped, and it had stopped like 15 years ago. But what we do see is at the, at the, <coughs> in, the, in, the in the newest data that uh, the world economy is slowing down, a significant decline in this measure. So trades falling faster than industrial production. The World uh, Trade Organization's trade reports uh, relatively alarmist. No? The last, latest version of it. Um, and I think what we can say is that the decoupling that's happening, for example, at the bilateral level between the United States and China is also eating into the aggregate data. Trade diversion uh, can only go some way to mitigate the bilateral effects uh, of uh, less trade, for example, across uh, the Pacific. And then uh, something I would like to bring our attention to is uh, uh, the enlargement of the BRICS group. Uh, the uh, to six more members. I think this uh, is significant. Uh, it's under discussed as far as I can say. There are implications on the world financial system as the BRICS have their own bank, for example, and setting up uh, uh, more autonomous currency systems. Uh, and the enlargement, of course, involves uh, this country here, the United Arab Emirates. And so I thought it's important to bring it up. In terms of numbers, share of the BRICS plus six uh, in global GDP, or in global population, this enlargement is not making a big change, but what it does is it brings in countries that have been outside of, uh, uh, of the inner circle of, uh, of policy making, like Iran, for example, uh, into, the, into the BRICS. And I believe that is a challenge uh, for the world order as we've seen it. Uh, the hope is that this does not lead to more polariza polarization, but certainly uh, it should uh, uh, th this event tells us something about the situation that we're in in the world economy, and we should uh, take note of this. Here I'll stop, Jean-Claude. Thank thanks you. for having me again. Thank you very much, Gabriel. You, you stick to the concept, <laughs> which is give messages, short, concise messages. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, on, on the inflation, I will only say I share entirely the of views. Uh, that being said, I was struck myself that core inflation on both sides of the Atlantic is now exactly the same figure, yeah. which says something and gives credibility to the fact that they have the same goal, they have the same definition of price stability, which is reassuring, all taken into account, even if, uh, as you said very wisely, the challenges are still there, of course. So thank you very much. Can I turn to Sébastien? Thank you, you Jean-Claude. <laughs> Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Yes, I, I'd like to share a few thoughts about uh, the way the world economy interacts with uh, world politics somehow. My starting point would be, uh, will be to observe that what makes probably the present situation quite unique is uh, the intensification of grid power competition in a context of uh, close uh, inter economic and financial interdependence. Uh, this has uh, translated uh, recently in a situation where we see that the multilateral frameworks are somehow destabilized and overwhelmed, as witnessed by the spread of uh, economic <coughs> restrictions uh, on trade and uh, investment flows, of uh, exceptional duties, uh, tariff duties, on uh, the spread of economic sanctions, uh, and so on. Um, on the mm, witness also uh, by the, the, the spread, the, the spread sorry, of um, uh, uncoordinated uh, uh, industrial policies and, and state uh, increased state interventionism. So this is a, um, a situation uh, marked 
by uh, increasing geopolitical tensions, but I think it's fair to say that at least until now, the result has not been, uh, at least not to a large extent, uh, it has not been decoupling or fragmentation. We've seen a kind of plateauing, and Gabriel uh, uh, showed it in, in figures a moment ago, in terms of the intensity of world trade. Uh, but there is no established trend toward decline in economic and financial uh, relations at the, at the world level. There are some, case, some, uh, um, some cases, some specific places where this is uh, indeed uh, there is a, um, a decline. Uh, and this is, for instance, the case in, um, in terms of the bilateral trade relationship between the US and China for well-understood reasons. But it is remarkable that even in that case, for instance, study after study, it is shown that when the intensity of direct trade between the US and China is declining, uh, indirect trade is actually uh, increasing, meaning that uh, the US is sourcing less imports from China, it will be sourcing more from a variety of countries, say Vietnam, Mexico, for instance, and these countries themselves source are sourcing more uh, components from China, meaning that aiming at decoupling what we are observing actually is not decoupling of fragmentation, it's more diversion with uh, ensuing costs and opacity. And questions about uh, uh, whether uh, uh, this is reducing in any, in any meaningful terms uh, uh, risk or, or uh, um, degree of dependence. So I think we, we somehow we have to live with this inter economic and financial interdependence. Of course, the situation of geopolitical tensions and economic interdependence create a very strong temptation to leverage interdependencies for political purposes, to weaponize them. And I think that's really a, a difficult uh, uh, defining feature of the present situation. But it's also a very difficult uh, objective. Difficult because economic and financial exchanges are defined by a principle of mutual benefits. They are taking place because they are benefiting both parties, meaning that it is very difficult for one of them to uh, usefully leverage uh, them. When is it possible? Well, when there is a situation with a very pronounced asymmetry. Uh, um, and only in such case is it possible really to efficiently leverage uh, these economic and financial interdependencies. And I think this is the reason why in the uh, recent examples of weaponization of economic dependencies, we are seeing the increasing importance, the, the overwhelming importance of finance, of information and knowledge. Because these are uh, dependent, dependent interdependencies, uh, uh, these are activities that rely uh, upon very concentrated networks. Think, uh, the monetary si think about the monetary system with the role of the dollar, think about international banking transaction with the role of the SWIFT uh, uh, system, think about information with social networks or uh, uh, about high-tech and semiconductors, for, uh, for instance, with uh, intellectual properties. In every each, each of these cases, you have very complex networks where a, a a few shock points, as uh, Henry Farrell and Abe Newman uh, uh, have called them, are uh, taking uh, uh, a central importance and can be uh, uh, leveraged and have been leveraged uh, for many of them recently. So it's a situation that in a recent paper uh, uh, published uh, together with uh, uh, Thomas Goma, we uh, define as geofinance, meaning uh, to, to reflect the fact that it is marked by an increasing politicization of financial and information flows. And it's somehow different from what we used to uh, think in terms of geoeconomic competition in the 1990s or the 2000s, which was mainly taking place within the framework uh, of multilateral institutions. Here, in many cases, uh, uh, this, uh, um, this competition and this uh, um, weaponization is in breach of uh, international commitments. So, 
I think it is not surprising, given this uh, uh, situation, that economic security is becoming an overarching concern for uh, governments. Um, with mainly two uh, objectives. The first one is to reduce vulnerability and build leverage uh, with regard to this uh, shock point, to these critical nodes in the world economy. And the second one is to control or at least master to some extent foundational technologies. And here I think the interaction is very strong with climate change because climate change is already an ongoing revolution in terms of for industry, for trade, for raw materials and, and uh, uh, energy. It's redefining the, the key technologies, it's redefining the, the, the way markets are, <coughs> uh, are working. So, uh, the, the challenge today for many governments uh, is how to um, uh, reach, a how to improve economic security. In a context where increasingly, for the reasons I described, they are not considering international markets, world markets, as secure enough. In a context as well, I think it's worth emphasizing that where isolation is clearly not the solution for two main reasons. The first one is efficiency. International division of labor is a sine qua non of efficiency today, especially for uh, sophisticated technologies. And the second one, uh, could be term, uh, a was term uh, relational power by, by Susan Strange, the need to have allies or at least to have partners to support your views. And we see that in this context of tension, this is <coughs> increasingly important. So uh, relational power requires openness, requires uh, 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 significant economic and financial relationships. <coughs> um, so. Uh, this is a challenge. I think it is um, uh, really important to emphasize as well that uh, increasingly the response of governments um, is uh, uh, using more ambitious, uh, more widespread industrial policies. Um, and uh, it's worth as well uh, uh, emphasizing that while uh, in the 80s, for instance, will be uh, economists were commenting uh, a lot the fact that uh, some policies were used as, as a, a, a way to kind of uh, appropriate rents as rent shifting policies. This is a typical example for that was uh, the competition uh, uh, between Airbus and Boeing and the, the efforts of government to somehow appropriate the, the, the oligopolistic rent in this sector. Today, it's more about control, about power, than about rent. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the same kind of logic I is taking place, a, a logic where uh, every, everyone is trying to appropriate and everyone needs to somehow to retaliate to what others are doing. So I'll conclude just in, uh, by emphasizing the, the threats um, uh, involved in these trends. The threats, of course, are additional and useless costs from an economic, uh, economic point of view linked to these additional obstacles and constraints. It's also in the additional rigidities uh, uh, ensuing from, from these constraints, and I think that uh, uh, means a lot in terms of uh, adjustment capacity for the world economy in the time to come, with, of course, a, a significant risk of escalation. All this uh, for a benefit which uh, we, we can discuss it, but I think so far uh, is very limited in terms of uh, uh, de-risking, uh, as uh, uh, the term, the fashionable term uh, uh, put it. And the m finally, the, the last and probably most dangerous threat is that all these uh, uh, constraints jeopardize the capacity of coordination at the world level. So I think the, this is a very important challenge in terms of economic governance globally. And I think part of the re response should lie uh, around r somehow ring fencing uh, the security concerns in the world uh, economy and the world finance. And um, as a precondition, probably to uh, update coordination and rules in other sectors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sebastian. I, I take it that your exploration of the uh, impact on global economy and trade in particular, and also the over, overall 
industrial diversification associated with the tensions associated with this will to de-risk to uh, have a, a world in which we would uh, incorporate uh, uh, precisely these major changes in the global tensions is something which is very important. I take it that uh, uh, with uh, global trade uh, being under the impact of this uh, French shoring, uh, reshoring, uh, or whatever, of course, it has a cost first, and second, it has uh, an impact on the global growth, and it has also an impact on inflation, to be frank. So uh, all this is intertwined in a way which is very striking. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Sebastian. <coughs> John, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And first, uh, to Thierry Montréal, congratulations on this new edition of the World Policy Conference, and thanks for including me. And having the chance to appear on this uh, panel with my friend Jean-Claude Trichet and his other illustrious colleagues. Let me make a, a few comments on the, uh, the outlook. It's, it's quite appropriate that uh, the timing of our conference today comes just weeks after the G20 leaders uh, summit meeting in New Delhi and the IMF World Bank annual meetings in Marrakesh. And as we heard from the minister and we know, in just a few weeks, the COP28 will be meeting here in Dubai to discuss uh, progress, or hopefully to make progress on climate change issues. Uh, I'll take as my uh, starting point the, for the outlook, the world economic outlook of the fund. No offense, Gabriel, they're, they're, very, they're very similar. They're very similar. <laughs> the, uh, the IMF noted that uh, global GDP grew 3.5% last year, 3% this year, their forecast for next year is 2.9%. And that's compared to the, in the space between 2000 and 2019, that's including the global financial crisis, world GDP had av growth had averaged 3.8%. And the IMF's forward-looking forecast is for the next five years of growth of 3.1%. In other words, by historical standards, this is a very mediocre outlook at best. They also characterize the outlook as rather uneven and quite uncertain. And notably, they don't expect inflation to return to its pre-COVID uh, performance until at least 2025. Not, uh, not a very uh, pleasing uh, result or forecast. So what are the key issues? Uh, to me, one of them is exactly the outlook for inflation. Right now, central banks are advertising that their rate policy is likely to be higher for longer. Of course, that depends on their expectation that inflation is going to be relatively sticky. It certainly seems reasonable at this point, but we also shouldn't forget that it wasn't that long ago that central banks were advertising their policy as lower for longer. It really is going to depend on the, on the outlook for inflation. And here it's possible that there will be not differentiation in target, as uh, Jean-Claude underscored, but differentiation in, res in outcomes. And if so, this will uh, have a substantial uh, impact both on global markets but also on the status of financial risks. Right now, a substantial uh, perception of, an, of financial risks is related to the substantial rise in long-term interest rates, especially in the US. And the combination of losses that that implies for uh, current holders of these securities and interplay with likelihood of continued high policy rates. So simply to say, I'll leave it with saying, if inflation outlook is more favorable than the consensus, just as it was turned out to be more difficult than had been the previous consensus before the COVID-related inflation hit, uh, these worries could uh, uh, diminish. But it remains quite uncertain. A second key issue, of course, is 
one of the sources for both the differentiation in economic uh, outcomes, but also the pressure on long-term capital markets has been the substantial run-up in debt, in especially uh, in the fiscal sector, especially among other places in the U.S., and the as assumed pressure on budgets going forward that uh, also are an important element of the perception of likely uh, financial and, and economic risks. Once again, this remains controversial in many countries in Europe, but especially in the U.S. The outlook for uh, the uh, uh, election in the coming year, and I know we'll be having a session on these things uh, later in the conference, uh, could have an impact on the outlook for uh, public deficits and the growth of debt. There is an obvious linkage that is often overlooked. One of the reasons why the run-up in public debt that occurred in the wake of the global financial crisis was not as anywhere near as destabilizing as many thought was because of the continuation of very low interest rates, including long-term interest rates, which meant for many years following the crisis, despite the increase in the stock of debt, the percentage of government revenues that were dedicated to, to debt service was declining, not rising. It's only in the last few years, last couple of years, that that trend has been reversed. Hence, the centrality of the, of the future performance of inflation and the uh, outlook for, uh, for, fiscal, for fiscal policy. Another key issue, of course, and one that's uh, been discussed already, is that for trade. For sure, we've seen the following. For the, essentially, for the 60 years following the formation of the Bretton Woods system, global trade grew faster than global GDP, almost without exception. In other words, it, just as the architects of the, of the post-war system had anticipated that the restoration of a global trading system was going to be a key element driving global development. Since the global financial crisis, or the, let's call it the end, for the past 10 years, eight of the past 10 years, global trade has grown more slowly than global GDP. And that remains the case this year. And the outlook going forward certainly remains problematic. There are various forces that are uh, at work here. One is, for sure, the uh, use of sanctions and protectionist measures that Gabrielle's slide showed us. These uh, are, and the, the threat of additional uh, use of protectionist measures is, a, is an ongoing threat. At the same time, however, in response to COVID, the experience of COVID, there's been a much greater attention paid to the resilience of supply chains. So some of what we see in the changing direction or the changing nature of supply chains in, uh, in various markets <coughs> is certainly trade diversion, as, as, as Asian was telling us. But some of it is, let's call it more organic, uh, attention to, um, to the issue of resilience and reliability of trade in, uh, in of supply chains in extreme in more extreme circumstances time will tell but the recent g20 um, leaders summit pledged to uh, restore the uh, functioning of the wto and to work towards a more open trading system however when you read the content of their undertakings, it is far from certain whether this, this is going to happen. Why this is particularly important is because of the, the uh, growth in trade and services that is 
of course, complicating because it is not well dealt with in, uh, in trade legislation. And secondly, the prospect of new technology that could once again bring forth a, an improvement in productivity growth similar to what we saw in the 1990s. So this, the development of technology and the evolution of the trading system is going to be, uh, is going to be very important. And in that context, I should have mentioned already, the increased, uh, the increased use of subsidies and other forms of industrial policy and its risk of complicating the, the trading system. So was there something new that has come out of this round of meetings at, uh, of uh, global leaders? And I would say yes, and that is a f greater, much greater focus on the provision of what are called global public goods. Matters to deal with climate change, environment, health, food security, etc. What has happened so far is a much greater attention at the level of intentions to deal with these issues that would imply potentially non-trivial changes in public policy and in the, uh, 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 the provision of these goods at a global level. But what is also clear at this time is the lack of clarity about how this will be accomplished. So it's an intent, a substan potentially substantial new public policy initiative at a global level that so far, in the, if we look at the latest round of, of uh, meetings, is more intention so far than real action. But it's something to watch closely. I'll stop there. Thank, thank you very much indeed, uh, John. I take your point on the longer, higher, for longer, uh, coming from the central banks. My interpretation is that they have to fight permanently against market participants that are calling <laughs> for interest rates decreasing as rapidly as possible. So it's, yes. a, it's a way to counter a yes. spontaneous, uh, that we, uh, I would say, move that we understand pretty well because they are talk talking their books and uh, it's uh, normal that uh, the market would give that signal. And I take from all what you said, and it, it's also valid for the other speakers, this uh, idea that uh, de-risking is okay, decoupling would be totally catastrophic, yes. which is more or less a message coming from Europe also uh, in the difficult circumstances in the geostrategic tensions that we are uh, experiencing. So I turn now to Marcus. We are up to you, Marcus. What would you say? <laughs> Well, I think we've reached the uh, point in the morning where everything has been said, but I haven't said it. <laughs> um, when, I was, when I received the invitation to participate in this panel, uh, I eagerly accepted because it's a great honor. I looked at the composition of the panel. I saw that we had so much talent on uh, macroeconomic and financial matters that I thought I would focus on effectively microeconomic issues as kind of a compliment. I think we are in the midst of a transformation of international trade and investment relations, uh, driven by the revival of industrial policy in the major economic centers. Compared with the previous international trade regime, this system will be more complex and considerably less transparent. It will be vulnerable to political capture by, politi by uh, special interest groups. Uh, it will possibly be accompanied by overall reductions in economic efficiency and uh, will give rise to international tensions. So how did we get here? There are two principal drivers. The first, which I hope, uh, if not all, most of us could agree on, is global warming and the need to adopt policies to internalize externalities that the market will not um, uh, do on its own. The second is more controversial, and that's the geopolitical uh, justification. And I think the best intellectual um, uh, rationale for this was actually provided by Canadian Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christia Freeland. She argues that, um, in essence, 
the West, during the Cold War, the West got lucky. Uh, the Soviet Union self-isolated, so the West was free to construct a liberal uh, open order, and there was no contradiction between uh, engaging in trade and investment relations, everyone prospering together, and military security. In contrast, in the present, China has embraced the global economy, and so this creates a tension between economic integration on the one hand and military security concerns on the other. Um, that is the intellectual justification for what uh, uh, was called decoupling. Uh, uh, President uh, uh, von der Leyen of the European Commission more politely called de-risking, which you, which you just referred to. In the case of the United States, these two concerns have been um, uh, met by two sorts of policy thrusts. In the case of the geopolitical objectives, the, the concern centers on semiconductor chips, the two main policies have been the CHIPS Act of the United States and then a set of export controls uh, aimed at restricting uh, export of chips and manufacturing equipment to countries of concern, mainly China and Russia. In the case of climate change, the thrust has been through two big pieces of legislation, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, often called IRA. And for uh, these remarks, I will focus on uh, electric vehicles and batteries. In both cases, the policies are complex. They're not entirely transparent. They make considerable demands on government competency and ability to implement effectively, and they've caused heartburn in partner countries. Um, the CHIPS Act uh, allocates a bit over $50 billion for subsidies for production and uh, research and development over the next four years. Uh, it prioritizes uh, supply chain security, that is to say chips currently made in Taiwan. It is open to both um, uh, domestic and foreign firms, and particularly uh, interest of firms from Taiwan and Korea, uh, and it excludes China and Russia. Uh, and companies receiving that funding uh, have to, uh, cannot build new capacity in China for 10 years. The export controls uh, aim at deterring pr high-end production in China, which means that the policy is dependent on third-party cooperation. This is a case where the U.S. government got lucky that the nature of the semiconductor industry is there are some choke points that require minimal cooperation from third parties in order to implement. But there's no guarantee that will be the case in the future with industries of very different industrial structure. Think, for example, biotech. The U.S. is not alone. Europe has its own CHIPS Act. Japan has adopted a similar set of reshoring or friendshoring incentives and, for example, is providing subsidies for uh, an American firm, Micron Technology, to build a plant in Hiroshima. So while the U.S. is leading the charge, uh, it is not alone. In the uh, climate change, uh, again, I'll just focus on electric vehicles because that's where a lot of the current trade action is. Uh, the U.S. legislation creates consumer incentives. It builds out the charging infrastructure, encourages domestic production. But the way it did it had uh, a strong domestic uh, preferences, which caused problems with our partners. Um, and enter, one of the things you need to understand about this legislation is the IRA is a thousand pages long. The Congress didn't know every detail of what it was voting for when it enacted it. It has all sorts of unintended consequences. One of these was to make those consumer incentives uh, apply to American-built automobiles, but not ones from Korea or European Union, who understandably got upset. Some enterprising bureaucrat at the Department of Treasury, who probably deserves some sort of Nobel Prize in applied economics, discovered that there was a provision written for trucks, which are normally leased, which if reinterpreted could be applied to cars. And the Koreans and the Europeans could continue to export to the United States and get the consumer subsidies. Likewise, the legislation incentivizes use of non-Chinese uh, minerals in the production of the batteries for those cars. 
Um, and it's created um, because of our vision that uh, uh, essentially endorses production and free trade partners. It has created the strange uh, phenomenon in Washington where Korean firms who build the batteries are lobbying the US government to conclude free trade agreements with Indonesia, Philippines, Argentina, and other potential sources of supply. In, it, it appears to be kind of a software patch, so to speak, and it wouldn't be surprising if the Congress went back and revisited some of these provisions if the Congress could actually act, which given the dysfunction is, um, is, is an open question. Implementation is uh, complex. Uh, it depends significantly on administrative regulations. It's not transparent. It is costly to remain informed, and that non-transparency creates um, opportunities for political capture by special interest. Europe has its own CHIPS Act. Um, it also has the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM, which is going to create problems as well. So more broadly, the European Union is tackling these problems with an emphasis on taxes. The United States is emphasizing subsidies and tax provisions. Um, and there is a need to bring, to reconcile these differing approaches to generally commonly shared goals. Um, there is a real question to me whether the US government is currently constituted, is up to the task of uh, implementing uh, a policy as complex as this one. And I heard that uh, President Macron has closed uh, ENA, the uh, French school for training uh, public uh, administrators, he might consider reopening it in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent conclusion, if I may, Marcus. <laughs> uh, uh, to be frank, uh, the name is different. I'm not sure that uh, the education will be that different, but we will, we will, <laughs> we will see. So uh, I guess that uh, uh, usually we, we go for a new round for second mm -hmm. remarks to be made, particularly to criticize what had been said by the other uh, members of the panel, or to compliment, or to do anything. But <laughs> any of us has the, the will to communicate something that would be complementary to what has been said. Otherwise, I, I go again, Gabriel. <laughs> you would be the, the first for this second remark. Would you agree? Yes. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, no, I, there's, there's not much uh, disagreement here, I think, uh, amongst the, the four of us. Uh, unfortunate for the, uh, for the conference, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, I think what we, we must uh, stress more than we did uh, in these last uh, 45 minutes is the internal uh, frictions that we're facing uh, in, within the United States and within Europe, uh, probably also within China. We don't see much into it, but, uh, but I, I guess it's, it's, it's there as well as an explanation for what we see in our external relationships. And yeah. uh, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the uh, regional elections in Germany in the last months, uh, you see the increasing polarization uh, that's fed by inflation, uh, but it pushes countries into a, into a more, let's say, um, aggressive external policy stance as well. Uh, and uh, the conundrum is, uh, on the one hand, uh, to, to get inflation down to, to make sure that the internal cohesion improves. Uh, on the other hand, this, this external assertionness or whatever it is, call it decoupling or de-risking or, or um, the search for strategic autonomy, all these things, that is actually making it harder to achieve those uh, uh, internal cohesion objectives. No? Uh, as has been said, no? the fragmentation is costly. And, uh, and, and that will be borne by whom? No? Most likely by the most vulnerable. Uh, and it makes this, this uh, in internal divisions even stronger. So that's a conundrum that I, I, I see I'm a little bit um, out of wits here. I don't, I don't know how we can deal with that. But I, th I think the first step will be to, has to be to see that, uh, that those uh, uh, de-risking policies tend to increase inequality. And, and then that fosters polarization with consequences that lead to more uh, external uh, frictions. Um, Thank you. Clear enough, clear enough. Sebastian, what would you say? Thank you. Um, first, perhaps a, a, a comment about um, uh, the fact that uh, we are uh, discussing the, the difficulty of coordination, the difficulty to stick to uh, international commitments and rules. I just want to emphasize that I, 
and I think it shouldn't come as a surprise that rules, uh, multilateral rules, are not able to contain uh, grid power competition because by themselves uh, they cannot. Uh, rules are unable to, to, to contain grid power competition as long as there is no political agreement uh, upon the, the direction, the objectives. And so I think that should be uh, reaching some kind of uh, political ag uh, agreement uh, about uh, the, the, the framework of coordination should be the priority. Uh, the second point uh, has to do with uh, um, uh, coordination and uh, inflation. Uh, a lot has been said about uh, the financial risks uh, entailed by the policies, uh, uh, monetary policies in uh, advanced economies recently. I think it's a good illustration of the threats uh, involved by the lack of coordination, uh, uh, the fact that it will increase the asymmetries in the world economies. In the world economy, it will make it, it makes it increasingly uh, difficult to uh, take into account a variety of objectives because uh, um, uh, it, it will uh, um, make coordination on various counts uh, uh, less less easy. Uh, the, um, uh, the, de the, the development, the spread of industrial policies is another example because that's only something that uh, countries with uh, uh, enough financing can sustain. Uh, so it's also a source of asymmetry, of lack of inclusiveness at the, at the world level. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. <coughs> your remarks uh, were valid uh, for uh, Europe as well as for the uh, global economy. I have to say I am struck myself by the uh, convergence on both sides of the Atlantic on the monetary policies, on the first results of monetary policy, core inflation being more or less the same. When we were in very difficult position, the Europeans were uh, uh, hit by the war in Europe much more than the US, obviously, in terms of uh, I would say price of oil, price of, uh, of food, the fact that uh, the U.S. is self-sufficient uh, in many respects, uh, both in fossil uh, mm. fuel and also for uh, food. Uh, and that, that, of course, creates a difference which is very, very substantial, obviously. And uh, nevertheless, I mean, the goal remains the same. The likelihood of reaching the goal is, in my view, as credible as uh, it was before, before war in Europe. And so that, that, that is something which is the silver lining, if I may, in comparison with what you, we, you had on both sides of the Atlantic after the first and the second oil shock, which was totally dramatic. Uh, inflation unleashed, uh, inflation uh, steady at 14%, uh, and interest rates at times at 20%. So we are... Uh, I would say claiming that 5% uh, in the US, 4% in Europe is too much, but I mean, <laughs> we experience 20 because we made mistakes in the previous mm. time, in the previous oil shock. Anyway, uh, what would you say, John, yourself? Well, uh, first of all, just to uh, continue on with what you've just been saying, the, uh, it's very positive that we've made progress on inflation and like you say, that uh, at least for the moment, th the progress is quite similar on both sides when we look at core inflation. What may be left as a residual effect of, among other things, the, the uh, war in Ukraine, is a difference, a change in price structure relative to what it was pr previously. In other words, it's quite likely that relative prices of energy in Europe is going to remain higher than it was previously. In other words, this is undoubtedly going to be associated with structural change in economic growth in, in Europe and in trade patterns as well. Another aspect uh, I wanted to mention was that we've, we saw an incredible boom in the Chinese economy in, re in past years that was associated with huge increase in demand for basic commodities, metals, et cetera, uh, of imports to the Chinese economy from, from elsewhere, huge increase in exports of manufactured goods from China. Uh, my sense uh, from my recent visit is uh, 
China is changing substantially. Uh, the, the, the source of their economic growth is going to have to change and it's going to slow down and the growth in domestic demand in China is slowing down and is likely to main, remain relatively calm relative to what it's been previously. And that's one reason why trade is going to remain more subdued and different than it was before, not just because of subsidies, of course that's part of it, and uh, not just because of sanctions, but because of some underlying, underlying changes in, in the global economy. That brings me uh, back and uh, wanted to make an, one a, a quick uh, uh, comment. So we've seen these, these uh, large challenges, and I would say, and we, uh, Sam pointed out, that previously, when the G20 was founded in the context of the global financial crisis, it was able to act decisively because among other things, there was a lack of, of a sense of great power conflict, as you remember. That it wasn't that individual countries forgot their, their interests, it was a, a real sense that if we don't hang together, we will, we will hang separately. But time has shown the weakness of the structure or lack of structure of the G20, that it has on the one hand put itself as above the multilateral institutions, but itself has no legal standing and has no voting process other than there's a, a veto power on the part of every, of every uh, participant. As a result, it's an organization that is, finds itself very hard, or I don't even want to know if, call it an organization, but uh, it's an entity that finds it hard to reach decisions and command action in a context of d either difficult or conflictive uh, issues. And I think it's, uh, it's worth contemplating whether if we're going to make real progress on global public goods that inevitably are going to involve difficult decisions that are not necessarily uh, to everybody's liking, if we're going to have to think about whether they need to be reassigned in one way or another to multilateral institutions that do have a structure that leads the decisions and can reach, um, uh, legitim uh, reach decisions that have legal legitimacy even in issues in which there's not complete consensus. Thank you, John. What you say is certainly true at the level of the United Nations and uh, the Security Council and so forth. I am a little bit more optimistic after the last uh, G20 meeting in Delhi, it seemed to me that uh, the, the concept of international community was still alive, a little bit alive. <laughs> that being said, <laughs> of course, it's not perfect. Marcus, you, you had already the privilege to hear all of us, so what would you say now? <laughs> okay, the second one, round. One, one last gasp <laughs> of international community. So if you set aside the geopolitical concerns and just focus on climate change, there's clearly a need for the United States, the European Union, and China to get on the same page and find ways of reconciling their diverse approaches to this problem. Uh, my institution recently hosted a conference on uh, the macroeconomics of climate change organized by Jean Pisani Ferry. Uh, and there was a paper presented there by two of my colleagues, Chad Bound and Kim Clausing, who argue that relatively minor changes to the WTO rules could go a long way in reducing conflict between the EU, the US, and China on climate-related issues. The problem, of course, is even minor changes to the WTO rules are gonna require a real diplomatic commitment. Mm. And I don't know if we're up to it or not. Well, very good remark indeed. So good cooperation between Peterson and uh, uh, Pisani, Jean Pisani Ferry. I, I was myself uh, chair of the uh, board of directors of uh, Bruegel Institute. So uh, I see that. Uh, and we, we have also a friend of the Bruegel Institute who's also in Peterson, if I'm not misled, uh, Nicolas. Anyway, so perhaps we have a little time to take a question. I see uh, three, three hands. Uh, so, Madame, you were the first. Please. <coughs> One second. Um, 
Ilona Antonyshin from uh, Poland, but uh, I'm working for Volkswagen, and you were commenting on the electric cars policies around the world, which is actually concerning me for the last three years, day and night. Um, I wouldn't be so hard on IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. Actually, I think it is a stroke of genius because it increased the speed of investment in electric car technologies, and these are gigafactory size um, in, um, investments each time, which is five billion dollar every one of them. So it is making a huge change because the big producers now started to invest quickly. You made the rush, which is actually following the rush from China. So the Chinese have a very stable support mechanism for electric car production, and they have made a great industry out of it. So right now, IRA made it possible to make this kind of support, so actually following China um, in, and in high speed in America, which made following by Canada, which made following by Europe. And right now, Europe changed so much the rules that I'm right now, I were able to work with the Polish government to establish in high speed, great, really great location um, parameters for gigafactories, and we established one, and we are looking for others. So I think, don't be so hard on the IRA, I think it was a good one. Marcus, do you have a response or comment? Well, as an American speaking before an international audience, I have an obligation to be more Catholic than the Pope. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm very glad that you find IRA to be such a stimulus <laughs> to uh, important policies around the world. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John, I know you're an American citizen. You don't have to be more Catholic than the Pope. <laughs> well, I was, uh, <laughs> I must say, I've been struck by two things recently with regard to electric vehicles. And I guess I should say it's a, 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 a being clear, I, I own one. But uh, I was struck in China how how common they have become, how rapidly. You can tell because they, the uh, uh, electric and hybrid vehicles have a different color license plate than others. And I was, I was astonished at how common they, ha they have become. Uh, I, given the, uh, uh, it wasn't obvious that they, uh, how developed the underlying infrastructure is, and we know that China uh, is uh, on a very uh, rapid process of building new electric plants that uh, uh, actually are not necessarily low, low uh, emission. In the States, in contrast, as you probably have read, after an initial spurt of, uh, of demand for electric vehicles, they seem to be slowing down. And uh, it's not, although it's the IRA uh, contemplates some subsidies to things like charging, charging mm -hmm. stations. Uh, I suppose it's not immediately obvious that the uh, consumer acceptance is going to be so rapid uh, without also sustained and substantial consumer subsidies. So I think this, this, the future here remains a, a, bit, a, a bit uncertain. That, uh, okay. I'll Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I had uh, other questions over there. Could you get a, a mic? Yeah. Jean Alolois from BPI France. Thank you to all panelists for your insightful deep dive into economic outlooks this morning. Um, I find you discuss a lot about um, security, risk management. My question to you is, what is the good news? What do you see upside in the current situation for whom and where? I'm not sure that I got exactly the question. Who, who could I respond? Gabriel? If the question was, where is the good news? Uh, I think there, there is good news. Uh, um, one is that uh, we are not 
uh, seeing deglobalization as was uh, as was feared by many uh, when the U.S.-China trade war broke out uh, and with all this crisis hitting, we see we see globalization as the economist put it. I think that's clear, but the global system, the trade system, has actually been relatively resilient. No, uh, the other piece of good news is. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about financial risks not yet fully materialized, but um, what we can say is that the, this first uh, 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 appearance of, uh, of bank crisis, uh, the Silicon Valley Bank and, and, and these sort of things, uh, have, have, be, uh, have been very, very well managed and contained, uh, and there hasn't been any, any uh, diffusion of those risks uh, yet. I'm not sure whether we've seen the end of it, but that is good news as well. And the third piece of good news uh, is that uh, uh, the subsidy race that the IRA uh, is part of it, no, that economists feel uncomfortable with, happens in the right area. Because what we do need is you know, more investment in, uh, in renewables, uh, in electric vehicles, etc. And there, a subsidy race is, is beneficial. No? Uh, if it was in, in, in steel or in, um, I don't know, in old-fashioned mm. industries, something different. But, but because we are facing a, a global common good here, or a bad, actually, the climate change that needs to be fought, this investment race is something that's positive. And so okay. that's three elements of, 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 of uh, more positive news, I guess. Well, yeah. <coughs> thank you very much. We are not only uh, with bad news, but also good news. G Gabriel is eloquent on that. Let me say, Gabriel, that I'm not sure that we will be always as satisfied with the behavior of the non-banks. For the banks, uh, the reaction has been very effective. And, uh, and uh, in Europe, for instance, we had applied by the rule of, of the Basel uh, uh, Committee and so forth and the G20. And so, so uh, we, we were reasonably protected until now, as you said, you're you remain prudent. But on the non-banks area, as you say, we don't have seen all the consequences of the higher <laughs> rates. May, maybe, uh, yeah, uh, Perhaps just please, Sebastian. Uh, 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 quickly, uh, I think the, the good, from an economic point of view, the good news is also that so far, despite the immense uh, uh, political tensions, uh, uh, political shocks, the world economy has been pretty resilient. Uh, and uh, uh, given the shock uh, it went through, uh, it's true about uh, the economic consequences of the COVID pandemics, about uh, the economic con consequences of uh, war in Ukraine uh, as well. Uh, so there has been economic cause, but not that much compared to the, the gravity of the, uh, of the crisis. Um, and I think it's uh, it's good to um, uh, emphasize uh, 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 to emphasize that uh, COVID, the COVID crisis was a moment where uh, vulnerabilities were uh, became more visible uh, for the, the general the pub, for the public. But I think uh, that was actually a moment when uh, these uh, international value chains prove their resilience more than their, their vulnerabilities be because within months, weeks in some cases, uh, uh, um, economic activity rebounded. Thank you very much indeed. I I'm turning to our founder. Uh, it is 10 o'clock. Shall I consider that we went through all what we had to examine or have you got have we got a little time more? No? <laughs> so, so I understand that uh, I have to thank all the panel, <laughs> panelists. They were remarkable. Okay.